Thank you so much. I, as was just mentioned, our last panel was a wonderful segue into the conversation we're going to have next um, from Dr. Nancy Byatt. Um, I, I recognize that throughout the course of the last few days, one of the topics that has come up pretty consistently has to do with maternal mental health. So we're very excited to have Dr. Byatt with us. Uh, Dr. Byatt is a perinatal psychiatrist and a physician scientist that's focused on improving healthcare systems to promote maternal mental health. And she's going to talk to us today about what has been previously referenced as MCPAP. MCPAP stands for the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Program, of which Dr. Byatt is the founding medical director. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Nancy Byatt. Thank you, thank you, Luann. Um, I appreciate it, it's nice to be here. And what a good segue, because I heard a few people talking about the access program and how you would have one. So I'll be telling you about our you know, access program in Massachusetts and a lot of the work happening nationally around this. Um, so MCPAP for Moms is, uh, stands for the Massachusetts Tried Psychiatry Access Program for Moms. It's explained my role. I direct, I founded and direct the program and I'll, I also direct a center called Lifeline for Moms where we, what we do there is we help other um, states throughout the country develop access programs. We also do a lot of research in this area. Next slide, please. So um, I'm just going to start with a brief. So maternal mental health, as you heard, affects everyone. We just, you know, just listening in just now, I heard a lot of, you know, we heard a lot about how this affects all of us. And this is actually a picture of my mom and her mom when my mom was a baby. And you can see they don't look very attached, right? My mom is, uh, doesn't look very attached. My mom, my grandmother had some unknown psychiatric illness, still don't understand it um, now. And my mom was sent to go to live on a farm with a family she'd never met for six months during her first year of life. So I grew up really acutely aware of the importance of maternal attachment and of perinatal mental health in general, because I saw, I observed my own mother work through the challenges um, from her disrupted attachment. Uh, next slide, please. And you know, I'm gonna fast forward to when I was a fellow at Brigham and Women's. And I, we heard a lot about this in our um, in this, these talks where I actually go back to the previous slide, please. I was working with someone who presented her second pregnancy. And she basically said that she didn't wanna get have depression again. She described, described her first pregnancy and essentially said that it hit her like a ton of bricks. She felt like she was in a black hole and that um, she, and she didn't realize that she had depression until she came out of it and realized, wow, I wasn't myself. Few things that struck me about this one, she saw many pediatricians, she saw OB providers, she saw it, she was seen by lots of people. No one ever asked her about depression. It was never addressed and it was never spoken about. So it was really a missed opportunity because she was seen in so many healthcare settings and nothing was happening. So you think about that what I described with my mom and then you and her mother, and then you fast forward 60 years, there's still major gaps in our healthcare system. Next slide, please. And we know that. Um, the vast majority of perinatal, and I would say perinatal mood anxiety disorders in general are under-recognized and untreated. In a review we did, less than a quarter of women got to an appointment even after they were screened positive. Next slide. And we just heard, I won't go into this because I heard you, you all just talking about this, about uh, Dr. Wakefield had mentioned that mental, maternal mental health conditions are um, the leading cause of preventable deaths. And they're actually on par with infection as the leading cause of preventable death in America. So we know that it has negative effects on um, parent individuals, children, and families. Next slide, please. And also this was alluded to, we know the COVID-19 pandemic. We know this parental mood anxiety disorder in general occur in one in five women and the COVID-19 pandemic is increasing these rates. Next slide. And there's also disparities. You also were just talking about this on the last, so I won't repeat this, but we know that um, disparities exist in both obstetric and perinatal mental health care. There's an increased risk. Um, for example, a lot of communities, um, communities of color, for example, other communities that have um, been marginalized or underserved, there's much more barriers to access and people may be less likely to get treatment. And there's also trauma that interplays both all of these things can make it harder to access the healthcare system and also harder to stay in it because a lot of times people can actually feel traumatized by the healthcare system itself. Next slide, please. 
so the good thing is that people are recognized this. Parity on mental health and substance use disorders are being recognized as a major public health problem. And many professional organizations and policymakers are recommending screening for depression, a lot of times for anxiety, and also for substance use disorders. But the question becomes, what do you do after a positive screen? Next slide. And you know, in general, families, providers, community partners really all want healthcare systems to address this. We, we literally just heard, in the, uh, again, in the, the, the previous piece, we heard people say, you know, we need access, right? There was a whole lot of talk about access. And when we think about the healthcare setting, the way I see it is that's really an opportunity to be able to skate, screen and engage individuals in treatment. So if you think about the woman that I described that I saw during my fellowship, who I'm gonna call Kai, you know, no one ever screened her. She saw many frontline providers. They didn't know what to do. Um, and um, it, it was a missed opportunity. And in general, most depression is actually treated by primary care, as is a lot of other psychiatric illness. So the thinking is, if we can help integrate mental health care into these frontline, uh, into these medical settings, then we can help increase access to care. Next slide, please. And one way to do that is by building frontline provider capacity, because the thinking is, by doing that, you can provide a solution by increasing access to mental health care because they will unfortunately never be enough psychiatrists. Um, I think I think I heard someone say Dr. Rockford was like maybe the only psychiatrist, parental psychiatrist in Texas. I think I heard that. Um, there'll never be enough of her, right? Or of even general psychiatrists. So the goal is if we can build frontline provider capacity, we can leverage us as limited resource and increase access to care. Next slide. I also heard you all referring to McPAP a lot. So McPAP is the child version of the program, which you have in Texas. In response to all of these things I just outlined, now over almost six and a half years, actually over six and a half years ago, we developed McPAP for moms. It's very similar to the child access program, which I know that you have, so I won't go into it, but our goal is to build frontline capacity but however different than McPAP, we do it for providers working with pregnant and postpartum individuals rather than providers working with serving children. Next slide. So we're very similar to the child access program um, with a few differences, which, which I'll talk about. We really have three core components, education, consultation, and resource and referral. And I'll go into each of these. Next slide. So for education, what we do is we provide training and toolkits, and these are publicly available on our website. These can be adapted for other states. Um, if you are interested in knowing how to do that, and, and you can email me, I'll have my email up at the end, but these are all, all the stuff is publicly available. So we have training and toolkits, and we do that to help educate and engage providers in addressing mental health. We have some, a lot of resources on our website, and we developed a toolkit um, with iterative feedback from frontline providers to really our experience as obstetric providers like algorithms. So we gave them what they were asking for, developed a lot of algorithm to be able to give them um, tools to be able to address these illnesses. And we also do trainings. We go to, we do grand rounds at birthing hospitals. We also do proactive practice level um, trainings and we also have um, regular webinars. Next slide. Training is great. However, we know that it's necessary but not sufficient to change provider behavior. What we, the way we think that our access program works, and I think in general for the child programs as well, is the telephone consultation. That's really the primary currency of this relationship we have with the providers or the engine of the access program. So, um, and what we have our uh, phone line that's open nine to five, Monday through Friday. It's staffed by um, several resource and referral specialists. And anytime during the week, someone can call and they can speak with one of our perinatal psychiatrists. We have five psychiatrists that cover the line and that's, we have a total of one full-time equivalent and it's split between five psychiatrists. Next slide. I'm gonna give a couple of case examples. So I was on call on Monday and a provider called and, and had a patient that had been on a, um, an antidepressant, uh, sertraline in the past, uh, antidepressant um, bupropion in the past. And she said, well, I wanna start the patient, you know, the patient had stopped it. She said, I'm thinking I should start a different medicine because I'm really comfortable with sertraline. So I think I should start on sertraline. We had a brief conversation about one of the main principles of prescribing in pregnancies, you wanna use what's worked. And she said, oh, okay. She realized she should probably restart the bupropion because it worked before. It was a brief conversation. She said, this is so helpful. She knew what to do. And then she went and managed the patient. 
Another example is of somebody who called about a, a patient who had a pretty significant history of pretty complicated illness. She felt uncomfortable. She wasn't sure what was going on diagnostically. We could have spoken for an hour and I still wouldn't have felt comfortable with her managing the patient, nor would she. So in that case, we recommended a face-to-face -face evaluation. We're doing these all through telepsychiatry now. What happens there is we see a patient for a one-time consultation. After we see them, we give recommendations back to the provider and um, we give the recommendations to the patient. We also talk a lot in these about non-medication treatment options, and we can also refer for therapy after face-to-face -face evaluations. We do that really when the provider's uncomfortable, there's a diagnostic question. We often do it when people need a long-term psychiatrist, but it's gonna take a while. And so sometimes we do this to bridge people till they can get in longer term with a psychiatrist. The other thing we often do is we're referring to the community. So another example is on Monday when I was on call for McPat for Mom, somebody called and she had a patient who had a lower EPDF score of about an 11 and still positive, but you know not less consistent with like major depression, for example, or less um, suggestive of needing medication. And she didn't feel the meds were indicated. She was concerned. The patient had been struggling to find a therapist. So in that case, we referred her to the community for therapy. So we do a lot of referrals to the community. So not a lot of the consultation do to have nothing to do with any medication management. I want to point out the difference between McPat for moms and telepsychiatry because people often sort of use the terms interchangeably between access programs and telepsychiatry. And um, telepsychiatry is a wonderful service that really helps get over logistical barriers and um, other types of barriers. What, how McPat for moms is different is we net, but a lot of times in telepsychiatry, people are still providing direct care. With McPat for moms, we're never providing direct care. We may see a patient for a consult, but even if we do, we never prescribe. Because the thinking and the reason we think it works is because we're very focused on building frontline provider capacity. If we started taking over patients and we started prescribing and treating them longer term, then we'd get blocked up and there'd be a bottleneck like there is everywhere else. So we really focus on helping the frontline providers do it themselves because, and that's why we think, you know, it works. It's one way to think about this is that we're teaching them to fish. We're not fishing for them. Next slide, please. We serve all providers for pregnant and postpartum individuals. So I talk a lot about obese because that's our primary um, population that calls us. However, we took calls from any providers. Next slide. Most of our calls come from obese, as I mentioned. We also have a substance use expansion. We're getting more calls from them. This number is higher now. This is an average since the very beginning, but our numbers are more like you know about 10% now. And then we get about 15, this fluctuates, but about 15 to 20% of our calls come from psychiatric providers. Not all psychiatrists are comfortable treating pregnant and postpartum women. So we really got to build their capacity. And then we take calls from pediatric providers at well child visits, which is another really important piece. But anyone who's serving a pregnant or postpartum woman, uh, individual, their providers can call us. Next slide. Um, I'm seeing a question. FTE provides, I, I, hold on, I'm just looking at this question. Oh, uh, I'll tell you what volume of frontline, pro the whole state. We, we, I think I'll get to this, but we take calls for the entire state. We cover the entire state of Massachusetts. So we have one FTE covers the whole state. Um, hence, leveraging us as a limited resource. Um, so for resource and referrals, what we, that's a good question. For resource and referrals, what we do there is we link, I, I gave that case example, we link women with therapy support groups and community resources. So we work, we contract with an organization called William James College Interface. And what they do is they have a database and that database includes information about um, it, uh, perinatal, in, uh, about providers, in, uh, insurance information, whether they're taking patients, their location, and so forth. That gets updated very, very frequently. So in that case, I described when the um, individual was looking for a, uh, a therapist for the patient, we can look, our resource and referral specialists can look in our database, and then they can, um, we can call the patient and help link them with resources, or we can also give that information directly to the practice. Um, and we do that a lot of times as well. So a lot of what we're doing is around referring for therapy and really helping the providers and the perinatal individuals they're serving navigate, you know, what is a, unfortunately a very complicated mental health system. Next slide. The other thing I want to point out when we think about these access programs is engagement, because I think people think you build it, they will come. 
our experience, and we've seen this happen nationally as we have these programs throughout the country, which I'll talk more about, there has to be a really strong engagement component. So this is really about getting out there, banging the pavement and, and engaging pro, pro, those frontline providers in this resource. So um, that is a really, really critical aspect. And in order for these programs to work, there really does have to be a very, very proactive um, and pretty intensive engagement component. Next slide. And so someone asked about this earlier, part of why um, you know, we think this model has been spreading and has become so popular is because it leverages um, a limited resources, mainly um, perinatal psychiatrists and also helps navigate that complicated mental health system for referral to therapy. So as I mentioned, our phone lines are open nine to five Monday through Friday. We have three hubs throughout the state. Bay State, UMass Medical School, and Brigham. We have one full-time equivalent of a psychiatrist that covers the whole state. So, um, so you'll get, you know, depending on what shift you're on, you'll get. We do the consultations at each of these hubs. Most of them now are being done through telehealth. For our resource and referral specialists, we have this fluctuates depending, but it's about probably 3.0 FTE right now. Um, but you know, still, this is a pretty small team. There is some additional FTE for, like, I have some FTE, for example, full-time equivalent. A portion of my time to lead the program. Um, how, and so there's some other administrative, but for the clinical portion, you can see it's a pretty small team. And we have 72,000 births in Massachusetts. So just so you have a sense, when you think about Texas, um, you can kind of think about, well, what would you need in Texas? We have one FTE for 72,000 births. You probably would need more time in Texas, um, assuming that the program is getting utilized and is busy. Next slide. So, a little bit more about our data. We've served a lot of providers and parents since we've opened. We've enrolled 77% of the practices in the state. However, any of them can call us. Even if a practice is enrolled or isn't an OB practice, they can all call, but 77% are enrolled. Of the enrolled practices, majority of them are, use, are utilizing us, which is great. We've served just under 10,000 um, women and other perinatal individuals. We, um, most of those, well, over half of those, we do those provider to provider encounters, like I gave that example for. And then for face to face evaluations, it's about 500. And this is important. Uh, next slide, because um, you see that about just over 10. Oh, no, go back. That was I wanted the circle. Thank you. Um, so you see that uh, about just over 10% of the telephone encounters that we do. Uh, about 15% or so, it fluctuates, turn into face-to-face -face evaluations. And this is really important because if we saw everybody and we did a consultation face-to-face -face for everyone, we wouldn't be able to do it. it would, we'd get blocked up, right, that bottleneck. So part of how we avoid the bottleneck and increase access to care is because we, we only do consultations when it's more complicated. So like a stepped care approach. So because we only see about, you know, about 15 or so percent, it's we can see usually see people for one time consultation within a week or two. And that is very, very, at least in Massachusetts, and I'm sure it's not no better in Texas, probably my understanding from conversations there is that it's access is much harder there that, um, you know, we can get see people very quickly. So week or two, the, and the OBs love it. They're like, wow, you can see my patient within a week or two. And it's great because when people really need us, we can see them quickly. Be great if we could see all 10,000 women we've seen in person, but we can't. So we really kind of, we really, we really have that step care approach that we can help the people that need us the most um, and, and provide that expertise for the ones who need that the most and build capacity and have, help other folks do it. Because I do think that what we do, yes, it's important and hard, but it's not that hard. We can teach people to do it. Um, and as you can see, for a lot of these, we do resource and referrals. So a lot of the patients were doing referrals for therapy. We're not necessarily doing this phone consultation for all of the women we serve. And on average, we're serving about 200, 300 women per month. So again, one FD of a psychiatrist, I could never do that by myself, right? Um, next slide. This is just presenting our data in a different way. Um, so the the red bars are the practices we've enrolled. The blue bar is the number of patients that we served. And as you can see, the sort of enrollment flattens out, but we're still, obviously our utilization continues to go up. And we've seen increased utilization during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've seen certainly a much bigger need, especially for the face-to-face uh, -face consultations because it's very, very hard to see a psychiatrist right now <laughs> for anybody, but particularly if you're pregnant or postpartum. Next slide. 
So the other thing I, the thing I want to point out here is that, you know, one of the things that's really, uh, I've been pleasantly surprised by, and this is really, to be honest, more than I ever would have imagined would have happened, is that since we started our program, we've really seen a culture shift. So when we first started, we really were focused on depression. And it was very purposeful because people told us, no one's ever going to do this. You're never going to go obese to treat depression. It's not going to happen. And what we found is, and we were very purposely our tagline was even about depression because we didn't want to ask them to rest depression, anxiety, substance use. We thought we'd alienate them. And we probably would have because this was not something OBs were really wrapping their minds around much at that point. We noticed after a couple of years of being open, and then we also had a lot of recommendations from ACOG, the Council on Patient Safety, which really helped bolster up the standard of care was changing. We were providing the resources and at the same time, the professional standards were also changing such that it was really becoming an expectation that mental health care be integrated into OB care. Um, and we saw they were calling about depression and anxiety and we started to be able to broaden. And then we noticed that they were calling a lot about bipolar disorder. Our data certainly indicates that when you look at our data over time, people used to say to us, they're not gonna call because they're gonna know how to do it. No, they just call about more complicated illnesses. They're still calling they're calling about really complicated things. Like we're often doing consultations now for women with bipolar disorder and the OB is managing bipolar disorder until they can get in. Should that patient have a psychiatrist? Absolutely, but it's better that the OB manages after they have a really detailed consult with one of us um, until they can get in to see a psychiatrist then they wait six months and they have no treatment and maybe they were hospitalized or there could be some other um, you know, negative outcome. So um, we noticed that they're definitely managing more complex illness. And then they also, we had a substance use disorder in 2018, um, a substance use disorder expansion led by um, the associate medical director, Lena Mattal. And um, so we, now we take calls from um, SUD providers as well, uh, substance use disorder providers. And we do a lot of outreach, the substance use community. And what we're really focusing on, what we started focusing on in 2000, uh, really putting a very purposeful focus on in 2020 is health equity. I'm gonna give a little bit more details about what we're doing there. Next slide, please. So, you know, just to, I wanna talk a bit about our focus on equity and what we've been doing on this. So, you know, when we started this program, we really were very focused, as I mentioned, pretty narrowly on depression. <laughs> and like people told us, you're never gonna get obese to do this. So we were really, I think, and probably as we needed to be at the time, quite narrowly focused on, we're gonna get them to address depression and like weren't really thinking of much else because at the time that was a massive culture shift, right? And I think at the time we really thought, um, you know, there was like a desert, right? I remember being at our postpartum depression commission and people would say, there's nothing. Like we did this map and there was literally nothing. So we thought we'll build an oasis where providers can come and they'll help the patients and we'll build an oasis. What is becoming very clear now that our program has been around and also there's been so much um, you know, attention on this as there should be that, you know, yes, there's an oasis, but the reality is that the way people get to that oasis is gonna differ and we need to develop and be doing outreach so there's no wrong door. Because for example, going to an OB is not gonna be the best approach for everyone, right? And that you're gonna have people that may not feel comfortable for, and, and so there needs to be other ways to be, um, engaging um, different populations based on what their experiences are and, um, and being able to have that tailored approach. And when we think about sort of this, um, the con continuum of maternity care, you know, McPat for Moms is really focused on sort of the access, the quality, the systems and setting the care team, but there's all these other pieces, right? That um, need to be addressed as we do this. And so we're really in the process of really working towards um, and the, the model has been very medical. It's really focused on this sort of inner circle here. So one of the things we're, we're really focused on is thinking about how can we begin to integrate more of this? We certainly do it during our consultations, but really being very purposeful about integrating all of these outer circles into the model. So that's a work in progress, clearly a lot of work to be done there, but that's something that we're really committed to and, and working on. Next slide. I'll give you a couple of examples here of what we're doing. Um, with our commitment for equity and justice be the forefront of our vision, values, and services. So we're really working on creating a liberate space to discuss individual team contributions to racism and foster anti-racist actions. So we meet once a month and we actually, we review articles around racism. We review articles around um, implicit bias, 
various topics and we discuss them. We discuss them as a team. So create a space to be having these conversations. We're also sort of reviewing, we actually just are adding this month um, data about race and ethnicity to our database. So we're collecting that. Um, we had not been doing that previously. We're also um, looking at all of our materials to make sure that our materials are promoting and highlighting um, promoting belonging and also that when we give a training we're discussing racial disparities and we're highlighting that and then we're also discussing giving the providers tools so that they we can also help them to be able to um you know approach um you know approach care in a trauma responsive way which we think is a piece of all of this the other things that we're doing is um we want to make sure that all the providers and patients have equitable access and we're you know also working towards intentionally collaborating with communities um, because we have been very medically focused. Obviously, these are very large goals. So this is all a work in progress, but this is our vision. And there's, you know, we're, we're doing a fair amount of concrete things to be able to move towards these things. Next slide, please. So kind of in summary of the model with McPat for Moms, all women across Massachusetts have access to some to evidence-based mental health treatment and substance use disorder treatment because all of their providers can call us. Any pregnant or postpartum individual in Massachusetts any of their providers can call our program, regardless of insurance. Um, and uh, next slide. And um, we are insurance blind. So we actually don't bill because we've had situations where a patient's gotten foot with a high copay or a patient has had not been able to come because of a copay. We do not bill because we don't want that to be a barrier. And so um, we don't actually bill insurance because we're covered, we're also get to our line item in the state budget. So that should, we, we do what we can to create that from being a barrier. So I'm gonna give about the cost, right? Because cost is always really important when we're thinking about these things. So in general, this wonderful study by Kara Zivin and her group found that untreated perinatal mood and anxiety disorders come at a very high cost. They're estimated to cost $32,000 per woman per mother-child dyad per year. If you take the state of Massachusetts where we have 72,000 births, you consider that without a system in place, less than a quarter of women are gonna get an appointment and you know, about 15% conservatively estimating are gonna have you know, depression or anxiety that results in a cost of over $345 million a year. Uh, next slide. Our program, um, which is about a million dollars a year costs 14, a little less than $14 a woman per year or just over a dollar a month. Our total budget's $1 million a year. So as you can see, the cost of the program is a lot less expensive than the cost of untreated illness. Next slide. We also have, we're, part of why the program is sustainable and is in, has pretty solid footing in Massachusetts is because our insurance companies, the, the payers, the, insur the, health, uh, the private insurance companies have to pay a surcharge for our program. Prior to this, all the insurance companies were, their members were benefiting, they were calling our program and they didn't have to pay. So what they did was through a legislative surcharge, which went through in 2015, all the private payers, the health plans have to pay a surcharge proportional to their amount of their patients that are insured. So if 10% of patients, for example, insured by Blue Cross Blue Shield, they pay $100,000 surcharge a year for our program. So um, that's, and that's great because it, 50% of our patients are privately insured, so it helps recuperate half of our costs. This legislation, legislated surcharge applies to both the McPAP for kids and McPAP for moms. Next slide. And we're very excited that McPAP for Moms is serving as a model for other states in the US. It inspired Congresswoman Catherine Clark to put forth federal legislation for other states to have programs like it. And that was folded into the 21st Century Cures Act. Next slide. And now there's 16 access programs available across the US. I hope that you know soon I'll be able to put a Texas, a logo and a star on Texas. Um, if you're interested in learning about it, the, the website's there, but you know, it's exciting that there's all these programs available. Next slide. And you know, what we're noticing is that they need to be tailored for the regions that they serve. So this gives an example, you know, part of this depends on funding. I do believe that uh, I agree if Florida can do it, Texas can do it. I, I agree with that, uh, Stephanie. Um, but I think if, um, you know, we do think that when there's all three components, but they're not always implemented that way. Part of it, part of this obviously depends on funding, the legislative environment and so forth. Next slide. But they do get implemented differently. 
And, the, and as I mentioned, the funding also different. So like Washington is also a line item in the state budgets. That's how we are in Massachusetts. Um, Florida is a HRSA funded state and there's HRSA grants, which a lot of people are, um, a lot of uh, seven of the states are funded through HRSA grants, which there's a lot of advocacy to be done to have more of those. Next slide. And uh, just before I close and we have time for questions, I want to mention that we have a Lifeline for Moms national network. We developed, because these programs are popping up and we're excited that you know, we have all these programs across the country, we developed a network of access programs. And our real goal is to improve maternal and child health basically through bringing the access programs together to facilitate peer learning and resource sharing and program evaluation. We really want to avoid people reinventing the wheel. And um, it also creates a community where all these programs can learn from each other. And we also facilitate program evaluation. If um, there's some information there that's available, but if you're interested in joining the network, you're, any of you, I think several of the people I know at the summit do come to some of the meetings, you're welcome to join. It's free, it's funded by the Perigee Fund. So we welcome any of you joining the network. And we do have a fair amount of programs that are aspiring programs, because we do a fair amount of uh, content on advocacy to sort of help programs that are um, looking to get funding facilitate. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, increasing, we believe that increasing, oh no, yep, thank you. Increasing frontline provider capacity to provide mental health care can promote maternal and child health. And uh, you know, hopefully we don't get cases like what I described with Kai, and, you know, six to, a long time ago with my mom and her mom. And, um, you know, and let, the good news is that led by professional societies and governmental organizations, the expectations of frontline perinatal care providers are really changing. So it's really up to us now to sort of help them meet that standard because they need our help. They don't know what to, they're not trained in this. And the good news is that that, that, that momentum is there. And so, I, and I do believe that these programs can really help them. It's basically the reason we called our center Lifeline for Moms is that we're a lifeline. They don't know what to do. They have a patient that they're seeing. We provide a lifeline for them and, and kind of hold their hands so they can actually manage mental health because it's complicated. It's not that easy. Next slide. And this is some information. Uh, just thank you to everyone who has been involved. And I think we have some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bayat. Yes, we do have a few questions. And so I'd like to start with this one. Do we know the statistic on how many of the moms who access your program are EBF, breastfeeding and formula feeding their babies? And is that data collected? We do, you know, I, we do collect that data. Yes, we do. So um, we, uh, yeah, we do. Whenever people call, and partly we need that clinically because we need to know if they're breastfeeding because we're often talking about medications and breastfeeding. So we do collect that data. Um, it's not all of our women. So it's, it's a lot of times we're seeing women pregnancy and postpartum. So of the women, I, it's probably, I have to look at the exact numbers, but I want to say it's probably about 50% of people that are, that are breastfeeding or postpartum. Um, I have to look at the exact data. I don't have the number offhand, but we do collect it. And I'd say it's probably about half and half of, of how many are breastfeeding versus not breastfeeding. Okay, thank you. Another question. How do you educate community clinicians about the availability of your consultation services? That is a very good question and it's an important one. So, you know, I'd say it's all about relationships. So when we first developed what we really did was we really worked with the, um, so we have a, uh, a director of engagement, Tiffany Moore Simons in OBGYN, and she really helped grease the wheels with a lot of the practices. And um, a lot of the other things we did was we developed a relationship with Mass Medical Society, Massachusetts ACOG, the Mass Psych Society for the psychiatrist. So a lot of it's about developing relationships and sustaining them with professional organizations, with other OBs. Tiffany would link us up with their colleagues and it's sort of creating a buzz. We would go and give talks at the national ACOG meetings. We would also cold call the hospitals. We literally cold called all the hospitals across the state. And we did grand rounds in almost all the hospitals. And we cold call practices. And we would call call practices. And I mean, the, 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 our psychiatrist used to say, we feel like we're like a drug rep because we'd go there and we'd cold call and we'd say, we have this program, we wanna come and do a training. So it's really about being pretty relentless about it, but also it's leveraging those relationships that are there is really important as well. Okay, and here's another question. You mentioned that you were funded by the Massachusetts State Legislature. Are there other sources of funds and are you a 501c3? Oh, that's a good question. 
So um, we are, we're funded by, yes, it's a line item. McPAP for Moms is funded, and so is McPAP, funded by the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health. That is our funder. And then we are, it's funded, it, it is, the funding for both programs is a line item in our state budget. The funding, we're not a 501, uh, 501- uh, 3C because the legend, the funding actually goes through Beacon Health Options, which is a um, basically a health, uh, it's an insurance company in Massachusetts that has our behavioral health carve out and they manage like our public health insurance in Massachusetts, which is called Mass Health. So it goes through, that is a for-profit company. So the money, it's legislated and it's aligned out of the state budget. It's funded by DMH. The funding goes through um, Beacon Health Options. And then like me, for example, our team at UMass, we have a contract with Beacon Health Options and that buys out my time and our team's time to be on the team. So it's centrally managed at Beacon Health Options. And that's where the money flows through for both the child and the um, uh, child program and the, and the MCPAP for moms as well. Okay, thank you. There's another question here. Is there prevailing wisdom on prescribing or continuing psychiatric medications during pregnancy or while breastfeeding? I would say that um, it's all about risk and benefits. And I'd say that, you know, one of the things we used to when psychiatrists call me, the first thing I ask is like, what would you do if she wasn't pregnant? And they'll have this wonderful answer. And I'll say, and often that's exactly what they should do if they are pregnant. So I think what often happens is that when people are pregnant or postpartum, providers get really worried about the baby and they forget that, you know, that the, the mom's health matters. In my opinion, the best thing that a perinatal individual can do for themselves and their baby is to get the treatment that they need. And sometimes that involves medication. There's a few exceptions. There's definitely some psychiatric medications that are truly teratogens and should be avoided. Most antidepressants, for example, a lot of the other psychotropic medications can be used and should be used. If a mom has illness, the, the, the illness itself has risks. So I think people think, well, I'm pregnant, I'm gonna ignore my mental health needs because it's best for my baby. It is not, that is a total myth. And um, usually when I see someone, I'm far more concerned, again, with a few exceptions of a few meds, but for the most part, about um, I'm far more concerned about the risk of the illness to the mother and the baby than I am about the risk of the medicine. And I'd say that goes for a lot of the antidepressants and also for a lot of the other classes of medication that we use. I mean, we use all classes of medications and they can be used and we do use them. And usually I think that the, I mean, obviously it's case by case. Thank you. Here's, here's another question. Have you been able to show a decrease in severe maternal morbidity or maternal mortality due to perinatal mental illness since the inception of your program over time? That is a good question. I wish I could say yes to that, but we are working on it. So my dear colleague, Tiffany Morsimus, who, as I mentioned, is the engagement director, is um, we're actually sort of in the process of applying for you know, a grant to be able to start to look at that. We do a fair amount of work with the CDC maternal mortality team. We have not been able to make that connection yet because that's a you know pretty rigorous study we need to do, but we are planning that study and want to do it. So hopefully we'll have an answer for you in a few years. Um, but I can't say we have that answer yet. But it's a very good question. We agree that that's a good question. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions. There was a question earlier about whether or not we have this type of program in Texas. And I answered that we do not at this time. We do have a child psychiatry access network, which was referenced earlier. And that is a way to use phone consultation to link primary care physicians with child and adolescent psychiatrists for children's mental health. Uh, we don't currently have an MCPAP for moms type program here. So I don't see any more questions. Um, there was something about, um, oh, here, here we go. No, we did answer the one about consultation. There's one about um, how can Texas begin to start this journey I don't think, uh, and I'm just gonna ask that to you, Dr. Byatt, what suggestions yeah. would you have for us as a state? Because we do have an interest in starting a similar program and how would you suggest that we go about doing that? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's, it's um, so I'd say that, you know, I think 
again, I think a lot of it's about relationships. So you have an existing child program, which I think really helps because having a child program kind of gives you that foundation. And um, I would say that there's a few things. I think one is um, what I have seen be successful is developing a, and I know you already have this because I've been sort of conversing, you know, in, in, in um, I've been in conversations with, with a lot of your teams and you're doing a lot of amazing work in Texas and have a lot of momentum is having a, having a, a group of people who are focused on kind of advocating for this. And I think a lot of it's about advocacy. So for example, in Massachusetts, we had the Postpartum Depression Commission. That commission had a, it was co-chaired by someone, Senator Lovely, who's now the commission is named after her, uh, um, uh, Representative Ellen Story, I meant to say. Senator Lovely is the current chair. Representative Ellen Story. And she, Rep Story had a lot of clout in the legislature and she you know, helped get, basically get the program funded. And so having relationships with, um, it, I, I know politically that may be challenging depending on the state, Massachusetts is a pretty unique state that way I'm realizing as I'm saying this, but that can help. So if you're gonna get funded through the legislature, that can help. They're also there, um, you know, I'm, we're hoping there'll be more HRSA grants and are gonna come out. There's a ton of advocacy being done to have more of those grants. So hopefully that will be another option. And, you know, all of you are welcome to join our network. We do do things on advocacy. So, um, you know, when there's things there, that can be another option as well. But I'd say it's about building sort of a momentum and a buzz and creating relationships with folks who are gonna advocate for this kind of funding. Thank you. Another question. So Dr. Byatt, let's say that you're giving a consultation to someone and you recognize that they might need a referral for a longer term relationship with a psychiatrist. Yeah. How long in general does it take for you between the time you recognize a referral is needed, one is made, and a woman can see a psychiatrist for assistance? Yeah, it's a great question. So one of the, you know, while, you know, um, you know, one of the limitations of the model is that we can't create resources that aren't there, right? Like that's not what we can do. So we can't, you know, say, oh, we're gonna find a psychiatrist and like get you in in two weeks. Otherwise, if we could do that, we wouldn't need our program, right? So part of this depends on the insurance. So with Mass Health, our public insurance, it can take three to six months to find a psychiatrist. And a lot of times the patients have to have three of therapy appointments before they can see a psychiatrist. So that's a long time. And for some folks, getting getting to three therapy appointments isn't realistic because they need to get on some beds before they can activate to do that. So um, that can be a challenge, which is part of why we do the face-to-face -face -face consultation to be able to do that. What we're finding that we're needing to do more of during the pandemic is we're actually doing follow-up face-to-face consults. So to give an example, there's someone who has bipolar disorder that one of the OBs was managing. And I've seen her, I think for two or three follow-up face-to-face consultations in the past year, because the OB is managing, he calls, but then in between things come up and she needs to be assessed again because she's not responding and it's complicated. And so we that's sort of a band-aid it's not you know doesn't solve the underlying problem but the underlying problem is, is is a pretty challenging one with private insurance you know it's less of a weight but even with private insurance it can still be pretty challenging um so that is one of the limitations but we sort of put a band-aid on that by basically helping the obese manage until we can get them in thank and, you yeah go ahead. i have one last question and that is what is one of the biggest obstacles that your team faced in implementing this program? That's a good question. Hmm, I have to think about that. that's a good question. I think, you know, I think the biggest probably obstacle in the beginning was people didn't think we could do it. <laughs> I think that there was a fair amount, I sort of alluded to this. There was a lot of like, oh, bees are never gonna do this. And you know, I think that was part of it, but the other part of it was um, I actually, as I think of it, the bigger obstacle has been that there's a constant tension between raising the standard of care and alienating these frontline providers to making them, to having them feel like we're trying to make them into psychiatrists. So when our first program first started, we, we want to be helpful, but we don't want to be so helpful that we're taking over, right? Or we don't want to be, we don't, we want to help them provide evidence-based care, but not so much that we're irritating them. So I'll give an example, like in the beginning, our providers, we got some, when we get negative feedback, it's often around, you know, like 
for example, one of our one of our psychiatrists was on the phone with one of the providers and was asking them like all these questions, like, well, what's their history of this and this and this? And these are like OBs who like aren't gonna talk to patients like we are, right? Like they're never gonna be, they're never gonna do what we do. That's not the point. We want them to do to move towards that. So that's always, I think, a kind of it, that's always a tension. You're always walking this tightrope between wanting to raise a standard of care, however, doing that in a way that you're still engaging them in the process and you're not alienating them. So like I'm on the phone with an OB, often their speech is pressured, they're really busy. And I try to weave in a little bit of a clinical pearl around, for example, have you screened her and follow up with her? And like, have you asked her about X, Y, and Z and teaching them about how to raise their standard of care for next time? If I do too much of that, they're not gonna call back. So that's the sort of, tension that we're always walking in between. And I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges. And that, you know, and I'd say along with that is the tension that in the very beginning, they would call us and say, I have a patient for you. And I'd be like, well, we're here to help you. <laughs> and that was also a tension because we're here to help them provide. In the beginning, they wanted us to take them, right? I think in medicine in general, there's always a, um, a kind of, you know, tendency to want, you know, we love to subspecialize, we love to like refer to the specialists, but it doesn't work in psychiatry, right? And so, but they'd always call like, we have a patient for you. So it was a big culture shift to kind of help them, you know, manage themselves. And what we do is ultimately give them a choice. Like if you give people a choice, you say, well, we can take them, but it'll take six months or we can help you manage them. They'd usually be like, oh, well, we want your help. But we have to give them a choice around it. When we tried to force it, it did not work. Like if we'd say, you need to prescribe this, they don't want that. We'd have to say, well, here's your choice. They can wait six months or we can help you. Then they usually say, we, we yes, please help us. But it's all about giving them a choice. But that was a pretty tough thing for a lot of our team to learn in the beginning. Thank you so much, Dr. Byatt. Um, I, on behalf of all of us who are listening to your presentation, we just wanna thank you for sharing the information about your program. And I am now going to turn it over to Dr. Lakey. You're welcome. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you.